This is the country of Morocco. Here, the EU is planning to commit 1.6 billion euros to be invested in the country's green and digital transition. This plan was announced at an official visit by the President of the European Commission in Morocco's capital. And this seems like a rather odd move for the EU. I mean, to begin with, we're not really used to seeing the EU investing in infrastructure outside of its own borders. And on top of that, why would the EU's highest ranking official arrange a state visit for a seemingly mediocre amount of money, at least by EU funding standards? Well, at first this didn't make any sense to me, but knowing what I know now, it's a carefully calculated play by the EU. You see, this sum of money is only the beginning of the EU's massive new plan that will very likely disrupt the balance of power not only in Morocco, but in the whole of Africa. Because in the coming five years, as part of a worldwide 300 billion euros plan dubbed Global Gateway, the EU is planning to commit up to 150 billion euros of that 300 billion to financially support green energy and digital infrastructure projects in the Africa countries. And in this way, enter the game for global geopolitical influence. Now, the obvious question is why? Why would the EU be willing to commit such a massive amount of funds outside of its borders, especially in a time of such a political and economic turmoil on the continent? Well, the main answer is China. You see, since 2013, China, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative, its strategic master plan to gain economic influence around the globe, has been heavily investing in developing infrastructure in Africa. And along with these investments, China has gained massive influence in the countries of this vast continent. And if you look at this 2019 map that shows the inflow of Chinese investment in the African countries, you can see the true scale of this. Scattered around the entire continent, these investments are not only plentiful, but many of them are also massive in their scale and importance. For example, you have the railway line from Mombasa to Nairobi and the Addis Ababa Djibouti rail line two arguably flagship projects of the Chinese, connecting two of the most important ports of Africa, Mombasa and Djibouti, with two of the biggest financial centers of the continent, Nairobi and Addis Ababa. This map showing the trade of the African countries with China comes to complete the picture. And as you can see, the Chinese presence on the continent is almost universal. It's for good reason too, as China knows that whoever has influence in Africa will gain a considerable advantage in the coming battle for global geopolitical influence. This is because Africa with its 54 countries is a huge and incredibly diverse continent, abundant with resources. And in the coming years, its economic importance is only set to grow. I mean, look at this map. These six African countries have been booming economically. Having been dubbed the Lion Economies, they have a collective GDP of roughly a trillion US dollars, and most of them have seen very high growth rates since 2010. For instance, Ethiopia, with consistent growth rates between 7 to 10% in the past decade, was one of the world's fastest growing economies. And the other lion economies closed a lot of years with over 5% growth, more than doubled the growth rate of the euro area in the previous decade that rarely went over 2%. Add to this some incredible demographics, as by 2025, Africa will feature more than 100 cities with over 1 million people, and by 2030, 42% of all young people in the world will live in Africa. Not to mention a rapidly growing middle class. So what you end up with is a vast area with huge economic potential for new markets to develop. Something China obviously wants a piece of. And it's not only the economic considerations that make the African countries so attractive in this battle for influence. It's also the geostrategic aspects of it. You see, ports like Djibouti at the Gulf of Aden are of high geopolitical importance due to them being entry points to valuable trade corridors. So, considering the growing economic and geopolitical importance of the African countries, the EU's plan to invest here starts making much more sense. Not to mention its growing worries about the Chinese presence in so many countries right at its doorstep. But this is not the first time the EU is collectively channeling money to Africa. Although back then, the EU was focusing its funds on some rather controversial attempts to curb the migrant crisis. But clearly, this time things are different, as the EU isn't just responding to a crisis, rather it's trying to actively engage in the world stage. And it seeks to start establishing itself as a major geopolitical player. To do this, the EU has put together this document from March 2020. In this document, the foundations for the EU strategy in Africa and a framework for future engagement are laid out. 
The first two stated goals are a partnership for a green transition and a partnership for digital transformation. What the EU is trying to do here is to combine its green agenda with its geopolitical ambitions. And sure enough, the Global Gateway Investment Package for Africa prioritizes these two sectors. And if everything goes according to the currently announced plan, the funds will be channeled towards investments in sustainable energy, projects to protect against potential climate disasters and agri-food systems. And not only that, there are also plans for investments in digital infrastructure like for example submarine and terrestrial optical fibers and data and cloud centers. Now, what's so interesting about this plan is that it is completely different from China's model of investing in heavy infrastructure like highways and railroads, as the EU doesn't want to invest in roads and railways. The reason? Well, just listen to what the President of the European Commission has to say about this. We're pretty good at financing roads, but it does not make any sense for Europe if we build a perfect road between a copper that is Chinese copper mine that is Chinese owned and a harbor that is Chinese owned. This makes sense. I mean, doing this would just strengthen China's position further and clearly the EU doesn't want that. But while it may seem like a selfless endeavor, there still is an economic rationale behind these decisions for the EU. You see, as an example, most of the sub-Saharan African countries have made enormous leaps in digital services with a widespread adoption of mobile banking. And on the continent, there are rapidly developing ecosystems of green energy. In short, there is a lot of space for these markets to further develop and the EU wants to tap into that potential. But the EU is differentiating itself from China in another interesting way. The funding model. In contrast to the Chinese model that heavily relies on loans and has led to allegations about the debt trap diplomacy practice, the EU program will feature a mix of grants and loans with very low interest rates, also known as soft loans. Now, despite the fact that the project hasn't even started yet, it has already attracted substantial criticism. To begin with, the whole premise of the project that makes it more about a confrontation with China rather than supporting the development of the African countries is inherently problematic. The package has already been criticized of simply repackaging existing EU programs into a new one without any significant innovation. Or to put it more blandly, at this stage it looks awfully a lot like a PR program. And then of course there are the concerns of the main stakeholders, you know, the leaders of the African countries who view the green agenda as a potential obstacle to their own attempt at industrializing their countries. What is for certain though is that we are rapidly entering a new era in international relations and if anything, this package is a showcase of the ambitions of the EU to move past its internal problems and start acting as a united political actor, projecting its power more prominently to the world. This adds one more parameter to the already complicated equation of geopolitical balance in the world. And finally, and most importantly, there is the African countries. Much like the Belt and Road Initiative funds, it can hardly be argued that the EU's money won't be a valuable contribution to the development of their infrastructure. But this needs to happen with the African leaders and people included as partners with an equal say, not with faraway observers making decisions about these countries in offices in Brussels or Beijing. In any case, what the future holds for Africa, China and the EU certainly appears to be very interesting, but that's it for this video. If you liked it, please consider subscribing. I've noticed that a lot of my viewers seem to forget to subscribe, so if you like my videos, it's a surefire way to make sure you don't miss any in the future. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.